After watching this video, you will understand why the Middle Kingdom period of Egypt was an amazing time of transition and growth, not only for Egypt, but for civilization itself. Now in this chart we are examining the timelines of the Bible, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Hittites. The Bible is a topic unto itself. We will discuss it in detail in other videos. For this video we will stick to just the secular histories of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Hittites. In episode 9 we discussed the Ur and Isin dynasties from 2112 to 1924 BC. It was a time in Lower Mesopotamia of massive migrations and a lot of internal strife, with very few periods of robust international trade going on. For Egypt, this was a time of the 11th dynasty emerging from the first intermediate period. Seventy years later, then Lower Mesopotamia recovered from the fall of the Akkadian dynasty. In episode 10, we discussed the kingdoms of Old Babylon and the Hittites. The kingdom of Old Babylon, which lasted from 1894 to 1595, was a fairly stable rule, and it would have fostered many long-standing trade relationships, both in and out of the kingdom. The height of Old Babylon's power was under Hammurabi from 1792 to 1750, which coincides with the time in Egypt when the 12th dynasty had just fallen, plunging Egypt into the intermediate period of disarray. However, the business of Egypt's 12th dynasty was continued under appointed rulers of the 13th dynasty, so trade would have remained fairly stable in Egypt even until the foreign Hyksos rulers took over Egypt. We can take a closer look at these relationships after we get the details of the Middle Kingdom history. So let's get started. In episode 6 we discussed the Old Kingdom period of Egypt and we also discussed uh, ways in which these king lists are joined together and what the three main sources are for the Egyptian history. In this episode we will talk about the Middle Kingdom history of Egypt. The last king of the Old Kingdom was Pepe II. He's the longest rule of any pharaoh in history, which was about 94 years. He came to pharaoh as a child and he died an old man. As the Old Kingdom came to an end, there was localized flooding in the Nile Delta, which was followed by famine because flooding produces lower crop yields. The influence of the pharaohs over the governors became less, and the governors became like middlemen between the pharaoh and the people. The governors were infighting among themselves at the same time as they were all claiming loyalty to Memphis and at the same time they were all vying for power against each other. Eventually the governors took over the kingdom and the actual rule of the pharaohs fell apart and this led to the intermediate period. And also during the old kingdom period Egypt had continually done military raids into Nubia and they had changed Nubia quite a bit. Um, the, there, there was a depopulation of Nubia and there was intermarriage between Nubians and Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians had displaced the Nubians somewhat between the first and second cataract. Now the cataract is a part of the Nile where the water goes over the rocks and becomes swifter and narrower and then it, after that it goes back to the muddy area where it widens out and becomes calmer. And the cataracts were a natural place where they built the fortresses to protect themselves and to use as a base to reach out further into Nubia. Now as the nobility grew they weakened the pharaohs of, old, of the Old Kingdom and they eventually replaced them and order fell apart into several different 
districts ruling themselves. And this is known as the first intermediate period of Egypt. Now the old kingdom of Egypt was the first six dynasties in Egyptian king lists. The seventh and eighth dynasties the very little is known of them other probably than the names of the kings. They ruled from Memphis and for some reason the power structure moved, it faded away in Memphis and re-emerged in Heracleopolis, which is on the Nile River about halfway in the middle of Egypt. Perhaps it was a strategic move or Heracleopolis became the power center because of uh, religious reasons or because it was actually on the route of trade which pr prevented Thebes from becoming the power of Egypt because Heracleopolis controlled the trade in and out of Thebes from the north which would have cut their abilities to generate wealth down quite a bit. Now the ninth and 10th dynasties are known as the Heracleopian dynasties because they are the lists of the uh, dynasties that controlled Heracleopolis. Now during this time there was also a dynasty beginning in Thebes. Now the governor Intef II controlled Thebes and Thebes was also known as the head of the south because whoever controlled Thebes had quite a bit of control over the Nubian contacts with Egypt and over the roads that led into the desert oasis which are marked on the map by these green areas and they basically controlled the entire southern portion of Egypt uh, from east to west and south. So there was quite a bit of power in Thebes, but the power was cut down greatly by their access to the north because they couldn't get through Heracleopolis. Now the son of Intep II was Mentuhotep I. Mentuhotep united southern Egypt around Thebes, beginning a new dynasty, which was the beginning of the end of the intermediate period. Now his son, Mentuhotep II, actually conquered Heracleopolis and Memphis, uniting all of Egypt into one rulership, beginning the Middle Kingdom period of Egypt. Now the rule of Mentuhotep II coincides roughly with the time in Mesopotamia of the fall of the Ur dynasty and the rise of the Isin dynasty. Now the Middle Kingdom period pharaohs lived in the shadow of the Great Pyramids of Giza, which were produced by the Fourth Dynasty of Egypt. Their pyramids were much smaller than the Great Pyramids of Giza and their pyramids also used a lot of tricks to hide the entrance because most of the Old Kingdom pyramids had been looted already and there was a big problem even at that time of pyramid looting for treasures. So the pharaohs began to get, to get more tricky and more defensive with the location of their burial crypt within the pyramids. And during the entire Middle Kingdom period of Egypt, during the 11th and 12th dynasty, the Osiris cult grew more and more and basically took over all of Egypt. Uh, this took the power away from the pharaoh directly and made him share power and, with the underworld and it also made the pharaoh more of a civil leader than a god leader. And it was Mentuhotep II that uh, secured the oasis outposts 
that are along the desert roads in the western desert, which is on the west side, the same side as Libya. And he uh, secured those outposts from criminals and gangs and thieves and helped the people to set up farms that were protected by patrols and they produced more grains and other crops for Egypt and they were also became a source of military recruiting. His son Mentuhotep III took a military excursion into the Wadi Hammamat, which is a dry riverbed that runs from the Nile River just north of Thebes over to the Red Sea. And they were able to set up a trade outpost at the Red Sea there. There's not much record about who they actually traded with or what it was exactly about, but it was uh, reaching towards the Red Sea trade. Now, Mentuhotep IV succeeded the throne only on some king lists. And he sent his military general down the Wadi Hammamat to look for a stone suitable for the lid of his crypt. And apparently the general Amenemhat returned with the lid, the stone, and brought it to Thebes. And then there's no record of what exactly happened, but Mentuhotep IV died and Amenemhat I became the pharaoh. We can only speculate that what happened between him getting the lid and him becoming the pharaoh. Now, Amenemhat brought an end to the 11th dynasty and was the first pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. His patron god at Thebes was Amen, which he took his name from. The 12th dynasty of Egypt was greatly marked by war to the south with the Nubians. The Nubians had a lot of gold, and Egypt was very interested in the gold. They also were uh, 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 provided a lot of soldiers to Egypt's armies. The Nubians were very famous warriors. They were very good with the bow. Um, they are black people, the tall, thin Negroes, um, very fast and very skilled runners and bow masters. Um, they became famous for centuries after these times for their skill in battle. Like the 11th dynasty, the 12th dynasty also built much smaller pyramids for the pharaohs and they also be used even more trap doors and false passages and things uh, designed to fool grave robbers who were always a threat to the pyramids. Now under the rule of a Menemhat, they began to measure the water levels in the Nile River, which is very significant because if you could possibly predict patterns in the river, you can time your farming and your harvesting a lot better. And you could possibly predict other things. And their art and their art and literature also increased quite a bit. This shows a, that a good solid government was taking place, and uh, projects were being funded, uh, things were being built. Amenemhat reigned about thirty years, and the thing he is most noted for is that he set up a co-regency with his son. In his 20th year, he made his son a co-regent king along with him. Now, his son was a regent along with him for 10 years. And his son was uh, like a general in the army. He was leading the military in a campaign while uh, the father stayed home in the palace. 
And while he was out on campaign, there was a coup in the palace, and Amenemhat I was killed. And his son, Sinusarit I, became king. Now Sinusarit I, when he heard about the coup in the palace, he rushed home from the war in the western desert against the Libyans, and he put down the coup, and he became the next pharaoh. There are two great scripts left from the time of Sinusarit I. The first one appears to be written by Amenemhat to his son, and it is a, a, a letter to my son, trust no one, basically it says, and gives several reasons, the main reason being on the day you die, nobody will be there with you. And the other script left behind is a story of a young slave boy named Sinu, who was in Thebes, and he heard of the plot to kill the king, Amenemhat I, and he didn't want to be caught up in it for being a part of it, so he fled into the Sinai Desert to the mines, and he was hidden, he, I guess, working among the miners. And when Sinusarit put down the coup, he heard about Sinu and what he had done, and he pardoned him and welcomed him home back to Thebes. Now, there was an original temple to Ammon that was built uh, during the Old Kingdom period in Heliopolis on the Nile River, and Sinusarus rebuilt that temple in Heliopolis. And he erected two obelisks there that were 66 feet high. One of them is still standing at that place. Sinusurus I also built several fortresses from the first cataract up to the second cataract, um, which provided a, a stronger base for the military to work from as they worked their way into Nubia closer and closer to the gold and the slaves. Sinusarit I was also the first pharaoh to build at Karnak. Karnak is like a city to the gods. It's a famous place in Egypt today for tourism, where you can visit the temples of all kinds of different gods all in one place. This um, city was built by about 30 different pharaohs who each built different temples there, starting with Sinusarus I, who built the temple to Ammon, and then uh, other pharaohs also built after him. Most of them were from the New Kingdom, and a few from the Ptolemic period, and a few from the Middle Kingdom period, all at Karnak. Now, Sinusarit I's son, and Menemhat II began to trade with the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, Lebanon, and Byblos. This is the Mediterranean Sea trade. He also dredged the canal that goes from the Nile River to the Fayum. The Fayum is a, the, like a, it's a lake just beside the, the Nile River, just south of Memphis, which is connected by a canal. And they were able to control this canal and control the irrigation to the farmland in the entire area. Now, Menemhet II's son, Sinusarit II, he continued the project of dredging the canal to the Fayum. And he was also very noted for his pyramid, which had trapdoors and false passages and uh, was a very unique pyramid for its time. His son, Sinusarit III, was the greatest king of the 12th dynasty. According to Manetho, who is quoted by Josephus, this pharaoh was very tall. He was over six feet six high. He was also a great warrior. Sinusarit III is the pharaoh that is known for his face being very natural and very solemn. Um, 
the pharaohs before him were very godlike but very lifeless. Uh, Sinusrit the third's face is very lifelike. And it's a very notable change from the pharaohs from before him. Now, since Sinusrit the first, the Nubian kingdom of Kerma had been expanding. So Sinusrit the third, he re refortified the fortress at Aswan at the first cataract. And he also built further fortresses up towards the second cataract. And he began to build the fortresses up on top of rocky cliffs, built right into the rocks, which was a different than the fortresses that had been built previously to that. He also built roads to the new fortresses uh, to increase his control over the area. And he set up a stele on the border between Egypt and Nubia, saying, I have built all of this, I have gained all of these lands. Any son of mine who protects these territories and these boundaries is a great son of mine. But anyone who does not protect them is no son of mine. Sernusurit III is also the pharaoh who built a summer palace at Avaris. Avaris is a city in the eastern Nile Delta, which later became renamed as Pi Ramses during the New Kingdom period. And it is the city which is well known for being the site of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. So um, Sinusrit III is a prime candidate for the time he ruled and for building Avaris for being the actual pharaoh that met with Joseph when Joseph was taken into Egypt um, after he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Um, we're not going to cover that right now. There's no real historical evidence other than the fact that Avaris is there and later evidence. But that's for another video. Sinusrit III also built his pyramid with secret passages and hidden doors and false ceilings to, to hide the location of his actual tomb. Now the son of Sinusrit III, Amenemhat III, he also is noteworthy for his very solemn and natural looking statue. He made numerous expeditions into the Sinai where Egypt's famous turquoise mines were located. He, uh, those mines were occupied by um, Semitic people from Canaan who also spoke a form of language that was a mixture of Egyptian and Canaanite. And is this around these mines they found some of the oldest alphabet structures that are related to the Greek and Latin alphabet. Amenemhat III built two pyramids. Uh, the first pyramid he tried a very radical design for the beams inside the pyramid that actually hold the pyramid up when they build the chambers inside the pyramid. Um, apparently the pyramid began to collapse during construction from the weight of the top of the pyramid upon the beams inside. And so then he built the second pyramid. The second pyramid is very famous. It has trap doors, false passages, false ceilings, all kinds of innovative designs to hide the location of the tomb. And outside the pyramid, there's also a very large labyrinth, which became very famous during Hellenistic times when the Greeks ruled Egypt. Amenemhat III, he also made his son, Amenemhat IV, co-regent with him before he died. Now, Amenemhat IV strengthened trade along in the Mediterranean Sea with the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, the Lebanon, and Byblos. He did expeditions into the Sinai and into Punt, 
which is another name for Libya. The reign of an the reign of Amenemhat uh, IV coincides with the beginning of the reign of Hammurabi in Old Babylon. So this is the very end of the 12th dynasty, just as Old Babylon is just taking off in Mesopotamia, which is going to open trade wide open along all of the trade routes. Now, as this was happening, the people known as the Hyksos were already migrating into northern Egypt from the land of Canaan and from the Sinai Peninsula. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to who these Hyksos are. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. First, let's talk about how the 12th dynasty actually ended. Amenemhat IV died without leaving an heir. So the very dynasty that is so well known for having a co-regency in case the pharaoh actually died, the pharaoh actually died. And he left his throne to his queen. And her name was Speknaferu. And she ruled for three years. She was the very first pharaoh queen which seems like somewhat of an accident. There are other famous feral queens that will be coming later on in history that were no accident. When Speknaferu died, this ended the 12th dynasty, plunging Egypt once again into a time of disarray and decentralization known as the Second Intermediate Period. During the Second Intermediate Period, the pharaoh in Thebes uh, was, it, there's, a, there's a list of kings that don't seem to be along bloodlines. They seem to be chosen. Each, king, each pharaoh king was chosen, perhaps by a vizier or a priest of some kind. There's no real dynasty. There's uh, just a long succession of chosen pharaohs. Now, they would have kept the business of the kingdom going through Thebes, uh, controlling the Nubians and controlling somewhat the trade through Egypt. But the Hyksos were taking over big time. They are known as the 15th dynasty. They started in Avaris, which was their capital. They took over Memphis and Heracleopolis. They never actually made any attempt on the 13th dynasty, but they very much shut down their ability to trade outside other than with Nubia. Now the reason that the Hyksos were able to come in and take over Egypt was because Egypt's warfare was mainly against the Libyans and the Nubians. They had not fought with the Mesopotamians or the Canaanites much yet. And in Mesopotamia, the weapons of war were far more developed than they were in Egypt. Egypt had no chariots, no animals to speak of in war. They used mostly Nubians and they fought with a, a wooden shield, spear, or just an old style bow. And the Hyksos had Mediterranean Middle Bronze Age weapons. They had compound bows, which were like thin strips of wood or thin strips of bone added in and glued together into a laminated manner. And this made the bow approximately three times stronger than a normal bow. They also had horse and chariots, which is no small thing to build. You can't just hook a horse up and say go into battle. The horse has to be trained how to be comfortable with that chariot in that situation. There were two men in the chariot. One would steer the horse and the other would use the weapon, the, uh, usually a bow or a spear the chariot had armor on the front of bronze. The men had bronze armor 
and they were again going against Egyptians with wooden armor on foot. So they had far superior weapons and probably tactics they were superior at. Egyptians were superior at building and engineering. They had built the Great Pyramids at Giza a thousand years before the Great Pyramid at Ur was even conceived. But for warfare, they were somewhat behind in Mes the Mesopotamians. Um, it seems to be the Mani who were settling in Upper Mesopotamia who knew these weapons the best, who were actually producing them, but they quickly became adapted by the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Kassites, everybody who was involved in lore time in Mesopotamia. And the Hyksos brought these into Egypt. Now, who were the Hyksos? There's a lot of speculation over who they actually were. Biblical scholars, some of them will say, well, they're the Ishmaelites because the sons of Ishmael, when Abraham kicked out the Ishmael from his house, God promised that he would also be a great nation of 12 princes. And his mother was Egyptian, and they settled from Shur on to Havilah, which seems to be the starting from the Sinai Desert. It's quite possible that the Ishmaelites were a part of the Hyksos. The Hyksos, um, by archaeology, seem to be a mixture of Semitic peoples who wandered in from Canaan and settled in Avaris. Now, some of them obviously were Amaru people. Now, the Hyksos were shepherd kings or desert princes, and there's a list of 70 kings from this time in the king list. Now, another theory of who the Hyksos were would be the Amorites themselves. Now, during the height of Hyksos power in Egypt would have been a time of a lot of trade happening with Babylon through Aleppo. And this is when the Hittite king Hattacillus took notice of the trade happening between Egypt and Babylon. And he said there is many great riches in both Egypt and Babylon. And this is when he began to go after Aleppo. It was his grandson, Mercilus I, who actually took over Aleppo and destroyed the city of Babylon, leaving it to his allies, the Kassites during the time of the Hyksos power in Egypt. Now, the 14th and 16th dynasties, uh, which are right before and after the Hyksos, those are just small offshoot kingdoms that appeared in the Delta that didn't actually rule over Egypt. They're just in the list of dynasties. The next dynasty to stand up is the 17th dynasty, which were priests in Thebes who learned how to make compound bows and how to use horses and chariots. And they united people around Thebes to build an army. And they kicked the Hyksos out of Egypt and the 18th dynasty or the, it was the 18th dynasty that finished the job of pushing the Hyksos right out of Egypt. We will talk about the 17th and 18th dynasties in the episode where we talk about the New Kingdom period of Egypt. We have covered the Middle Kingdom period of Egypt, and we can see the effects that the Middle Kingdom period had on the history of Egypt where they were no longer god kings, they were more civil rulers, and they weren't as great as they thought they were, because people had better military technology than they did, and they lost. And they had to learn that technology, 
to overcome their oppressors. And this was also a period marked by a transition of civilization itself, where Hattasilis, the Hittite king, noticed the importance of trade through Aleppo, and that prompted him to attack Aleppo. And this also might have contributed to Amaru peoples moving south, which would have joined the Hyksos in Egypt, possibly, expanding their kingdom. They were simply the western Amaru people in Canaan who were asserting their power over Egypt. Uh, a loose band of barbaric mercenaries who were all involved in the trade in through Canaan. My next video is going to be continuing from Abraham in the Bible. Now that we have looked at the history, uh, we can talk about um, Isaac and Jacob. I'll see you in the next video. So, if you enjoyed watching this video, just like, share, and subscribe because it makes this video rank higher. You can also leave a comment in the comment section down below or leave a question. If you want notifications when a new video comes out, you have to turn on the little bell.